creative, very intellectual, and also liked comics. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll talk about Raw. <clears throat> Am I holding this too close? Is that too loud or anything? Okay, I got the, I got the big. Um, Raw, Raw appeared in a, a period in comics history when there was really a blight. Uh, underground comics had kind of petered out. Um, there were the, the, the direct market was trying to get up and running. There wasn't really much interest in art comics. Definitely, I would say there was almost no interest in it. And these two people uh, met each other, had different skills, shared this love of comics, and in the creation of Raw, something blossomed. They, something came together. Uh, this, this beautiful magazine, which I brought a copy uh, that I, I bought off the shelves when, in 1986. It was a big, beautiful book. We'll, we'll talk all about what was in it. Um, but it launched careers. It changed the conversation in comics completely. Um, I think I'm going to just introduce these two people right now. Um, the author of Mouse and winner of a Pulitzer Prize, Art Spiegelman, and Francois Moody. <laughs> Art director of the New Yorker. Well, thank you both so much for being here. We are going to, uh, this is a roast, by the way. I don't know if I explained that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like a host. Yes, yes. So um, this image that's on the screen right now, Art, um, we, we, Art and I picked this out to show because this is the final event of our Columbus Citywide Comics Festival, CXC, uh, Cartoon Crossroads Columbus. And this image, um, Art, will you explain? Well, when I was reading one of the many articles that seemed to be appearing about this, either in the Dispatch or whatever. It was in Forbes, actually. Forbes. Uh, they talk about the crossroads between the art and commerce, so it took me a while to back up and stop being too narcissistic to realize they meant it more generally than this particular image, which was of some importance for me, uh, which was a uh, lithograph made in stone where it's hard to make the world's most expensive Sunday comic section. Um, and it was uh, the bastard children of art and commerce murder their parents and go off on a Sunday outing. Uh, so uh, you know, there's, there's art for my mom, and then there's commerce for my dad, for my dad. And that's basically the brew that maybe all art comes out of because Michelangelo had a pope and uh, yeah. we had publishers yeah. as we came up. Both but but it just seems like to be, it just seemed to be basically an illustration of at least that notion. Well, and it also illustrates an idea that I've heard you uh, express, uh, like comics, you'll spell it C-O-M-I-X, C-O apostrophe, M-I-X, co-mix. Like it's the co-mixing of art and commerce. And um, yeah, our idea with Cartoon Crossroads was to have the crossroads represent, you know, Columbus's history in, in, uh, in the, ja the jazz circuit or the vaudeville circuit. And certainly a lot of cartoons came out of Ohio. The list is rather amazing. But I also liked it that this Forbes reporter said that the crossroads represents the, the crossroads between commerce and art. That's pretty cool. All right. Um, let's see. Where would I like to start? Let's, why don't we start with uh, arcade? Now, what do I have? Right, let me get an arcade there. Now, do I tap on this? Is that what I do? You could. I could. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is this is Art's computer, so if I mess up a little bit, I apologize. Um, arcade. This was this was a really important uh, starting place for you and Bill Griffith, right? Oh yes. And uh, it grew out of the underground comics that had been flourishing from '67 into the '70s a bit, but it was all caving in by '70. Uh, 
or let's say uh, the paraphernalia and head shop uh, kind of places that where our primary distinguished distributors uh, were being put out of business. And so uh, Bill and I have talked about doing a magazine together a number of times, even when we first moved out to San Francisco at about the same moment in, I think, 72. Uh, and he had worked with me on short order comics. I had worked with him on Young Lust. And here it felt like important to build a, a life raft for what was left of an underground comic scene that was all San Francisco based, pretty much. And the idea was to make something that didn't have so hardcore of content that we just couldn't get on a newsstand anywhere. So our goal was to get on newsstands with something that felt a little bit more like a magazine than a, an underground comic. So it was more like a normal sized magazine that had content pages and editorials and letters and wasn't as free form as the underground comics. But uh, it was sort of, we were growing up and comics were growing up. The underground comics had done something really important, which was, it was the first time you didn't have art and commerce, and there is no commerce in the underground. You're yeah. a drug dealer, <laughs> but it had nothing to do with uh, making money off your comics. But you did have, as a result, a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. You're making comics for other grown-ups, even though they were all stone, blonde-haired, whatever, but like us. It's so it's peer-to-peer. -peer. Yeah. Uh, so it was all peer-to-peer, -peer, let's say. And that opened up the possibility of as we were going, okay, um, you know, sex, drugs, and violence is good, but there are other subjects too. And it allowed Arcade to move into another kind of territory uh, that Bill and I were very game to explore. And you were in San Francisco? Yeah, for the first few issues, I moved back because I, I couldn't take the whoops so I got out of the kitchen. I just want to like back up a little bit and think about what, what were the late night conversations you and Bill were having that kind of excited you about the possibilities of comics, or or what was making you think maybe we should try this uh, this way? Well, it was an outgrowth of a certain approach to comics that involved like it being relatively natural to talk about literature and painting at the same time we were talking about comics. And I think Bill and I, Bill Griffith and I, had a lifeline with each other because uh, you know I hung out with the ripoff press crowd, but you have to discuss which beer you like most or which kind of pop cocktail you like the most, or cars. And I wasn't good at any of those three subjects. Uh, and so it was, it was great to hang with them, but we didn't have that much to talk about. So a, a constellation of artists who were sort of uh, game to stretch that became uh, the core of the arcade group. I think, that's, I think that's interesting that you were like, oh, it just seemed natural to talk about art and paintings and comics. Because of course it is. Uh, but it wasn't thought of that way at all at the time. Right. Let's let's switch over to uh, Francois. I, gotta, I have to use my memory to see if I know where that was. So if I go in this story. Ah, there we go. Oh. There we go. Francois. So Francois, <laughs> you are you grew up in France. Um, and at some point you made a decision to move to New York and you, I'm, you know, I don't know how much of your personal life you feel like opening yourself up to, but you, you, would, would it be wrong to say you like practically, you fled France or you were looking for something or? I actually was studying architecture at the uh, Beaux-Arts in Paris and I wanted a break from um, my studies. It's a long course of studies, it's seven or eight years, and it's all in studios. And I didn't think I was moving anywhere, but I wanted to get away from Europe, because when you're in France, I had gone to Italy, and even England, and Spain, and Germany, and so on. Here, at least it was far away. And I thought that I would like... So the, the main attraction to New York is just that it was far away. It was far <laughs> away, and I would be away from everything I knew and anybody I knew uh, for a year. And the uh, round trip ticket was... Could, you, could you speak English then? Um, I thought I could. I <laughs> have gotten good grades at school in English uh, until I landed. And I was doing okay in England, but when I landed in New York, then the became obvious that I couldn't understand a word. Well, they language. barely speak English in New York. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, um, I, I thought I would do little jobs here and there, and I did. Um, I, whatever was available, it's New York of the 70s, it was pretty 
in Ivanka, that there was uh, selling cigarettes um, at Grand Central Station, and that was uh, working for Japanese architectural agency making models. Well, did you, when you, well, when you did it, did you have like a, someone to meet you and kind of help you? No, no, I mean, that was part of the adventures. It was like <laughs> um, finding my own way, and I thought I would get all those little jobs as a way of paying the rent. Um, but the language was a big issue, and somebody, I met suggested that I pick up an issue of the Sunday New York Times, and I did, and two and a half months later, I was still like turning the pages <laughs> trying to understand what this massive thing was. So on my own, I thought like, well, you know, what would be good as a print object? It would be comics. So I went to the newsstand expecting to find Actuel or Metal Journal. Oh, okay, so you're saying that you were looking through the New York Times trying to kind of help you kind of get the language down. Yeah, so on one Sunday's time yeah. for about two months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it takes me that long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, uh, but now you're, okay, so now I'm following you. So now, right. you, now you're going to, you said, okay, what well, the heck well, with the newspaper, I'm going to go look for comics. Comics, comics is a good way to get an introduction to the language and to the lingo, to the way it is used, not what you learn in school, but the way people use colloquial and expressions and so on. Um, and there was nothing on the newsstand, whereas in France there would have been also the, the comics magazines that would have been of my generation. So I was really surprised and I asked to run and by then I had met people in independent cinema. Uh, there was the anthology film archives, there was a number of places and I liked that mindset of the filmmakers. It was very visual, not much language. <laughs> Most of them were silent films. And one of the people I asked around knew art and said, like, oh, here is this magazine, give me a copy. This is an arcade. Well, actually, which was her permit? Uh, short was, order. So it was short order. Um, and I discovered, I, I saw a couple of issues of Arcade. I liked uh, Kuchel Bross's work. I liked um, Justin Green's work. And then I saw Short Order and I saw Prisoner on Hell Planet. So Which is, yeah, that's a pretty fabulous film. And I was so shocked by this that uh, I had access to meeting art through the casual network. Well, wait, 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 hold on a second. Okay. Um, so yeah, so you have now, you're now kind of meeting people and getting, uh, making friends and hanging out with it. Artistic. I don't, uh, would it would be, is it, is, if I say intellectuals, does that sound kind of creepy or? Well, everybody yeah. was, you know, carpenter and, um, you know. They were just people with, okay, they were just they were people with good taste. Okay. Well, it was New York of the 70s, you know, the difference between then and now is the price of the rent. Um, <laughs> so, you still have a lot of young people coming out of college that want to spend a few years in New York. Now the barrier is so high. I see for our kids' generation, you have to pay like twelve hundred dollars to share a room in Queens, yeah. forty-five minutes away from the city. It's ridiculous. But in nineteen seventy, I paid a hundred and ten dollars a month, uh, and I was able. To, that was a quarter of what I earned doing odd jobs here and there. And I just say that her jobs require her to write a novel just so she could have the back of the lab. <laughs> this is cigarette girl, carpenter, plumber, electrician, which is why I married her. And uh, <laughs> as well as well as uh, actress in a Richard Foreman play, as well as I'm sure the architectural model making. Did I miss one? Um, well, I was also an assistant to my father was a plastic surgeon. Right, so she was a plastic surgeon. Yeah. yeah. So she was a plastic surgeon. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the job was very related. Plumbing is much harder, actually, than plastic surgery. <laughs> <laughs> However, this, this is, is it eager uh, The The skills that you are displaying here, I don't know if you're learning them on the go. You're definitely a go getter. You uh, can do many different kinds of skills, you adapt to it. You're, this is something that's going to come into play in a little bit. So you said that uh, a filmmaker friend was... But that, that, that was also part of the New York of the 70s, and it still remained true, is that I could learn on the go because people were so open about 
that told me things. Right. And I tried to keep that when I went back to Paris. I thought like, hey, it must be that much interesting fields in Paris. But in Paris, the door was closed. Unless you were an expert, unless you already like had your degree, who are you to ask questions? Whereas in New York, it was, you know, I met with the foreman because he was putting on a play. And at the end, he said, anybody interested, come for our open house. And I would ask questions when I met art, like uh, I couldn't speak English, but I would ask questions. And people were incredibly welcoming and open to explaining what they were doing, talking about it. You're talking about what their projects were. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It wasn't at all like, I came from a culture where you have to pretend to be an expert on everything, and you're yeah. always being made to feel inadequate to have to a very culturally inclusive culture where just simply because you were interested in New York, people just accepted you as also the art world we were hanging out in, it's not what would be called the art world now, but the art world now is a bunch of like stockbrokers who learned that there's more money to be made in putting out some kind of, um, I don't know, cutting, cutting a pig open and putting in, in amber or whatever. Uh, and a lot of these people were self-taught outsiders themselves. They looked like insiders to me from underground comics, which was over the edge. But they weren't like uh, the sophisticated party boy painter gang. It was uh, college dropouts who had a, a desire to know, uh, people from other cultures who didn't quite fit in anywhere else, but people who were reading and came out of a generation of abstract expressionism and whatever. That was like the specific sub subculture of what we were uh, hanging with. All right, so we're at the point now where um, it's Ken Jacobs, mm -hmm. the filmmaker who was friends of both of you, and Ken's the one who showed you Arcade. Yes. And then introduced you to art. Well, let's, yeah, well, let's hear, let's go to, first, here, here we go, back to art. When I first met art, casually, I didn't like him. Because, <laughs> well, because he, he spoke so fast, I couldn't understand a word of what he was uh, saying, and uh, he seemed very passionate about something that I had no idea what he <laughs> And it's, it's really when I uh, read his works that I was, um, and, I, and I'd seen some of the other comics, but Prison on Help by that left me speechless and all of a sudden the fact that someone could be so tackling a topic so personal um, in an open manner like be so um, candid about his feelings I did this thing which I never did which is I picked up the phone because speaking was hard but certainly speaking on the phone was even harder, and then I started asking art questions and listening to him. And eight hours later, I was still on the phone, and I realized <laughs> I, I gotta like you know meet this guy. I kind of like this guy. <laughs> I'm trying to find prisoner. It's now. probably near the bottom. Wait, yeah. Right below. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think it's oh. here. You're getting warmer. Yeah, you're getting warmer. This is almost as bad as showing the slides. You should have just. Yeah. Like, <laughs> okay. Well, I'm gonna have, here I have a, a some. Yeah, and, you know, it, it since has been incorporated in mouse, but at the time it was printed on newsprint, again in the context of short order and the other and it's, and it's, uh, It really stood out from all and the And it's the story of... The story about my mother's suicide. Uh, and when I did it, it was one of the first times I ever did anything since I started getting work published, where I wasn't sure if I wanted it published or not. I just needed to do it. And that was because I, my mother committed suicide in 1968, and I think this is 72 or something. And the intervening four years, all I could say is I had amnesia. If somebody asked, I could say my mother committed suicide. But I didn't think about or remember the events that surrounded it. And then almost by fluke, like just a, a casual argument with a woman I was living with in San Francisco, I realized I'm not angry at her, I'm angry at my mother. And then everything came flying back in. And at that point, I just had to write it down because I, I actually re remembered something that had been cauterized. I was cut off from it. And at that point, I wanted to like see what it would look like as, as pages. And uh, I really thought I wouldn't publish it while I was doing it. But as a result, it allowed me the uh, intimacy I needed to just go for broke. 
And it was such a smart thing to do, like the tough man squaws interested in. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what was so different is that I had been, you know, looking at the independent film, like uh, not as Ken Baker, but the things like Tom Hunter, Piper Song, the Stan Brackett, and the, a lot of the uh, independent film. And those were intellectually, like, very exciting, but they were hard. They were demanding, like I fell asleep half the time. Everybody in the audience did. It was the nature of those films. But actually, it's worth slowing down for, for a second, because when you talk about comics, and oh, of course you talk about art and literature, the thing is that the people who define themselves as a kind of artist, which our generation of cartoonists just couldn't, it wasn't the vocabulary for it. Um, we didn't, well, when you talk to uh, one of these filmmaker people that we knew, or the theater people, and you talk about communication, they would bristle. Like, communication? No, people must commune with you. In other words, you get to be the shaman and they get to like uh, let you read their entrails or something. And me, I came from a world that had a magazine called Communication Arts, which was about how to sell cigarettes to people. Um, and, and that notion of communication, I don't think it would be as difficult if we were hanging out with writers. Like writers uh, acknowledge that there's an agreement between them and the person picking up the paper, that there's a degree of communication going on that wasn't part of the abstract expressions contract, for example. I, I, didn't, I didn't realize that. I and, and it was very clear for me because my roommate, um, after I got the law fair, the roommate said to us, uh, she also had an interesting way to earn a living. She was a cook on a tugboat because she loved boats. and. Um, but what she really wanted to be was a painter, and she would drop off her slide to all the galleries and so on, to O.K. Harris and Sonneband and Leo Castelli, uh, every school, like all of the would-be artists would do. And I would ask her, so Stephanie, like, you know, can you please tell me what you're doing? Because it wasn't that obvious from looking at her painting. And she said, sure, no problem. And then she would go on into a half hour explanation about I studied with so and so, and he did this. I studied with Ken Nolan, and he did like geometric circles, and then the stripes, and then in reaction to this, and then that. And like half an hour later, it's like, okay, I'm sorry I asked. <laughs> but it didn't have any kind of visceral um, resonance for me. Neither did any of the things that were in the galleries around it, whereas arts work and very many of the strips in the underground comics were so democratically available. And then art started showing me Winsor McKay and actually like reading the old Mad magazines and um, reading Harriman and patiently explaining like every single thing to me. And it was so, uh, a world opening up of like, amazingly challenging, interesting, intellectually stimulating content in plain sight, available. Can I, can I ask where you were getting uh, these comics to show her? Because in 74, it would be pretty hard to get a get Harriman crazy cat. From his closet. <laughs> From his closet. Oh, yes. Uh, but it was in my closet because I'd become really interested in old comics well, when I was about 14. Uh, and began ferreting these out from whatever places existed, and had the good fortune of having a mentor who was uh, the first and main collector of crumbling newsprint uh, in the 60s. In fact, at the Billy Ireland, there's drawers that I passed that are from the Woody Gilman collection. And uh, so this man had, nobody really knew, say, Little Nemo, they just didn't know it. Uh, like now, it would actually be part of your cultural uh, Obligation. If you don't know it, you can sound, you feel stupid, you know. Um, so uh, if you're at like that time, comics, yeah. yeah. Well, no, we, you know, now it, it's even broader than that. And at the time, nobody knew it, but Woody Gelman had collected at least two complete runs of Little Nemo from whatever sources it took. He was an ex Fleischer animator who then got a job working for Pops Bubblegum, which was Mike Nagichi during the uh, 60s and beyond uh, where that earned me a living. But his uh, giant basement in Long Island was uh, an absolute treasure trove. So I had old Sunday pages through Woody. He also was the person that saved all of the little memos you could find at the Billy Island, the original artwork. Uh, that was his doing. 
So Crazy Cat, again, I was finding what, there was a book that had come out in the 40s when it had that book. Uh, I found little bits and pieces here and there, so. All right, well, I, I kind of wanted to get into art to, uh, into breakdowns, but I'm not finding images for it. Breakdowns is right near the top somewhere, below where you... Is that it? it? Is this? This oh, might be a breakdown. Yeah, that's breakdowns are up there. Yep. Oh, yeah, yes, there it is. Okay. So, at this, okay, now at this point, you've moved back to New York. I moved back to New York in, I think, 75, okay. I think. Uh, and I was still working with Bill on Arcade, but long distance, and Bill just mentioned the other day that there was voluminous correspondence, all of which I'd forgotten, as well as forgetting whether I came back in 75 or 76 to New York. Um, and it was, uh, while doing that, I was just trying to figure out what I was doing here. And the same man, Woody Gelman, uh, thought he was gonna make a billion dollars uh, because Elvis Presley died. And he figured if he could come out with the Elvis Presley poster book in two, three weeks, uh, he'd sell gazillions of copies. So, did he? Uh, did he? No, it didn't go as well as he thought because he had it printed in Asia and it took about, by the time it came back, there was, there was all this, all Everybody the, had it. Yeah, every, it, was, it was over. Nobody cared about Elvis and Jeff that much. Uh, but while that gleam was in his eye, uh, he was asking everybody he knew, like Maurice Sendak, what kind of book would you like to make? Uh, Art, what kind of book would you like to make? And he just wanted to publish all these things. He started a little magazine called Nostalgia Illustrated, I think, or Nostalgia Press Illustrated. Uh, never quite came out, but Chrome worked on issue zero that hadn't come out. I worked with on issue beta right after that that never came out. But here he figured he really had it. And what I really wanted to do is make an anthology of the work I had been doing in underground comics and in arcade and have it in one place because... That doesn't seem right. <laughs> Kirk is coming down on me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, okay, I'll shut up. <laughs> um, so, now, uh, so... The, Two, a couple of pieces that you did are crucial to moving forward here, and one was Prisoner uh, on the Hell Planet, mm -hmm. and the other one was an early version of Mouse. Mm -hmm. Now, did those start in Breakdowns, or they were no, definitely no, so Breakdowns was a gathering of the underground comics that and you had the done. arcade things that I had done, and the problem is I work slow, I don't work long, so I, nobody could really locate what I was doing because it was in the midst of a lot of other <laughs> stuff, including stuff by me that I'd never want to see reprinted, like a comic strip about a talking turd in the toilet bowl that was basically a rip-off of One Froggy Day, the animated cartoon set that was a talking turd rather than a frog. And um, I was doing this nonsense stuff, and then this uh, um, mouse happened because I was invited into a book called Funny Animals, and the only requirement was that it be anthropomorphic characters. And at the time, it seemed like a very big deal to me because Robert Crumb had done the cover, and the lead story, and there were no requirements of what one might do, and this was what I ended up handing in, something about cats and mice. Yes, now, I read somewhere that your original idea for cats and mice was applied to different, not necessarily Nazis and Jews, but something else, and I thought that well, was interesting. Well, this, this doesn't specifically refer to Nazis and Jews, it's the cats and the mice, and in the longer book, uh, uh, my father's working in a, a shoe factory, basically, which is actual, but here it was a kitty litter factory, so there were little transpositions, but compared to the underground comics that surrounded it, it was relatively sober. Right. Um, so there was that, and then when I was first invited into Funny Animals, I just figured I'd do like a DC horror story with a, a humanoid mouse that would get caught in a mouse trap that would break its neck at the end of the story. Um, <laughs> so that didn't pan out too well either. Uh, so, so this was... I thought the breakthrough strip for me, it sort of let me understand that I was able to do something from the more interesting edge of what was happening in underground comics, which had to do with Justin Green's Binky Brown having introduced uh, autobiographical material. So this came from just thinking about my own path with my parents. And when I first met Art, he was uh, gathering the work with the idea of doing this hard cover album, which had no equivalent. I mean, not only were there no comics on the newsstand, there were no comics in bookstores. Right. There was no place for this to do such a thing. But for me, what was interesting is that I saw him do the paste-up mechanicals and the color separation 
and all of the work that goes into the production of a book, and it's very similar to the stuff I've learned uh, to be an architect. So now is this yeah. when you decided to buy your own pretty press and drag it yeah, upstairs actually, in Yeah, actually, as lab? a matter of fact, uh, you know, what, what happened is that I saw him work really hard gathering all this, and the agony of getting it published because Rudy uh, had a stroke and then the book was off and then somebody else bailed him out. I mean, it just went on for months like the book was happening, not happening. And again, the, the, nobody wanted this book to happen except Bard. And eventually we went on press with like Bard money um, and I was there and the color signature uh, got messed up. Um, and then we were like going through the sheets, trying to sort out what was salvageable of a very small print run um, out of sheets that where the make ready had uh, done badly. And I just felt like, I'm gonna get my own printing press and I'm gonna get this right. Actually, it came from something even goofier. Like, when Francois was thinking of going back to study architecture some more, but didn't want to, we're having these conver existential conversations about what one does with one's life. And so, what would you like to do? So, make books. So I said, oh, you mean be a writer? Uh, no. Uh, oh, so you want to be a publisher? Yeah. And for her, being a publisher meant making the book physically. <laughs> making <laughs> books. Yeah. And, and so now, and how, describe this printing press that, I mean, how Well, I mean, it's a, you know, so like I, was, I was, so, sure. well, part of it had to do with the rise of instant printing in the 70s with those small compact version of offset printing presses were available in print shops that did Is that what this was? This yes. looks like a so it was, or <laughs> it was a multilist um, and it didn't have a very large bed so I couldn't do super large uh, sheets on it and it was only a one color press so and when I did color work I had to run it four times. You had a resort to, to get four color, you had to yeah. run in the same Yeah, I would have wanted a two color uh, press. Well, you wouldn't, I mean. Yeah, <laughs> really. So now is, that, this, now, is this in your loft? Well, it was because I, I went to, um, I wanted to learn, it's not that obvious, and um, I went to a print shop and they wouldn't let me, you know, I had an apprentice to be a plumber and they had let me, but they wouldn't let me in a print shop. So I went to a vocational school. Um, in bed and they were uh, teaching vending machine repair as well as printing, it's a, a craft. And I did take the course which gave you hand-down aspects. And then after that, they actually offered me a job in oh, a nice. print shop, uh, which I almost took, but instead I wanted to have so, my own. So is this, is, this like, is this the same loft you still have? Yeah, yeah, but we didn't have an elevator, so it was difficult to bring. I love that. I've seen the loft somebody, somebody, literally. Yeah. 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 I made a deal with a building next door as an elevator, and I befriended the people that were um, and, 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 uh, the building next door. So it's starting yes. to sound like a pop -like And then so we put the press in the elevator, and then from the elevator, from the uh, loft, onto the roof of our building, and then down. One flight of stairs. And the jerk who was like bossing these other two people around. He's the guy I was buying the print on. <laughs> so we're coming down, he's coming down a flight of stairs. He's got two guys uh, at the top of the stairs. And he starts yelling at them. He says, I got it, I got it. And then he says, All right, move it that way, let it go. So they let it go. And it pushed him down the entire flight of stairs, slammed into the wall, broke the sheetrock. And if it, had, if it landed on a beam rather than on a, uh, the sheetrock itself, that would it have been. pushed it into the So it is like a It looked like It was a cartoon. Yeah. The shape of time. Fortunately, there was no blood shed. And the, as, and the press wasn't broken, but it got it in there. But it meant everything she printed, we had to haul reams of paper up four but, flights of stairs. But I kept the press on a dolly, so. Um, you I could wasn't... move it out of the way yeah, if you so wanted to set the table or something. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm actually super impressed and love this part of the story because um, I, I, did, I, Vijay and I did a lot of self-publishing, but I mean, Jesus. I was I was studying architecture and I loved like the projects in school, but then the idea of graduating and being an architect in a firm was deflating, was even exciting because then nothing. 
such a drain dump should be produced because there would be like all the constraints of the clients and uh, sites and so on. But with publishing and with printing, it felt so direct. And to try to explain this to somebody who all of their life has been able to go Apple P and then boom, it comes out as like a <laughs> printer. You can't know, but at the time, the ones that really understood were our Russian friends because they walked into the law and they said, you have a printing press right Russia, there. Russia, that's a <laughs> prison of offense. <laughs> I, I, I would have to, we have to jump ahead because we have a lot to cover. Oh, okay. so, <laughs> how did we see Apple? Yeah, all right. Um, but, so, but it's at the core. Of it is at the core, and I'm just going to very quickly show a couple of things. Uh, these were uh, the streets of Soho. This is a project. So the way to earn money, yeah. It is a way you earn money. You use your printing press. You printed up these maps. Did you design them? Did you run? Well, that looks yeah. like your artwork. Mm -hmm. And so you would take those around to shops. Right. Because uh, what I liked about publishing is also that I didn't have to apply for grants, which was against my religion to have to beg for money for my project. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do a quick starter or any of those things. I liked the kind of um, moment of truth where you bring something to a store, you leave it there, you put a price sticker on it. If people want it, they buy it. If they don't want it, you take it back the next okay, day. Okay, what's really crucial here, though, is that you are, this is, this is self-publishing. You mm -hmm. are, and you're going around and looking for outlets for people who will sell it. You're creating- your But the real business world. core of this was, it looked like a map of little listings of all the stores and galleries, each of which had to be paid for by the store and gallery and had to be talked into doing this. And then they would sell the map, so it became a self-distributing thing. Yeah. But it meant that for Francois to be involved in publishing meant not just learning how to operate the printing press and work on the graphic design and the production of this thing, but to become a salesperson, which was not her personality at all. And she had a very, um, a husband with a screw loose, basically, like, what do you call the publishing company uh, for this thing? I said, we could call it Crass Publications, because it was about selling ads, you know? And so she didn't know what Crass meant. It was like, bonjour, I represent Crass Publications. How, how, did, how did you guys come up with the name Raw for your publishing company? Well, he wanted something I couldn't pronounce. Uh, <laughs> I wanted something with three letters when we started. Oh, so is it just because of that? Yeah. Using your love of that? Yeah. So, uh, well, but we, I we incorporated a business called Robots and Graphics back in 1978, like two years before even thinking about doing the magazine. When I got the press, yeah. I, I and what were you, you doing then? You weren't doing the books. I was doing really? little mail books, so anything that I could print on my a small format because I didn't have a large. Um, you little slide thing. above the one you got. It's probably some of that stuff. Um, That's fine. I was doing a zip scope with Bill. Um, so this was like a story that Bill Griffiths designed to be done in this format. So it was a long, uh, wordless narrative, and then I made up uh, I think a hundred of those where I, I stitched them together the way I'd learned from my dad, the plastic surgeon, how to roll bandages. Um, so I rolled the strip uh, along the Actually, it was originally done as like uh, microscopic sized panels for a two page spread of comics, but real tiny and silent. And it seemed like this would be the natural thing to do, even though it meant rolling strips of paper all taped together that would stretch across an entire, uh, how long is it a lot? Yeah, 100 feet or so of uh, space, and then rolling these things up, mounting them on little camera film spindles, <laughs> putting them in a slide box where we have to cut out by hand the little square screen. It was insane. Okay, so you're, 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 I really, I really tried to get Art to bring one of the old ones out of the out of the drawer, but he wouldn't do it. They're a little, they're a little delicate. Um, okay, so you're living in Soho. Or maybe not so. Yeah, no, it was so old, but, uh, yeah. and it was because it was cheap again, and it was not legal at the time. But um, that's why a lot of young did, people. Did you say it wasn't legal at the time? It wasn't legal to live there. Now, if those were factory spaces, and they were not, they didn't have certificates of occupancy. So at night, you had to put curtains <laughs> over the windows, otherwise, and they didn't have like sanitation. So spent half our days trying to find places to put out garbage. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, all right, so you're, you're 
living illegally in some <laughs> building <laughs> in New York City. <laughs> um, you have a, a giant printing press on a dolly that you move around the house. Uh, you're printing uh, these maps uh, during the day to make money and kind of touring the city and making contacts. And at night, or also you're using it to make art projects. One slide above that, I think yeah. that's the one. One or two, there's like a bunch of little things that Francois has made. What, what, what time, how much time do we have? Because I feel like, how could I only have like 10 minutes left? Is that right? What? <laughs> Is that right? That's not right? Somebody tell me what's, what we're going to do. All right, and, and then, uh, all right you know what? You know what? what? Yeah. Get us off of this day. <laughs> <laughs> Good all luck. Right. So, um, there's a bunch of little mail books and things that you made. Yeah. Uh, that it? Yeah, that's it. Well, that's uh, stickers. Oh, the stickers that yeah. I draw. Yeah. Uh, above or below that, there's a bunch of little booklets and stuff in one slide. This was to make it easy and smooth. Yeah. Oh, here it is. Uh, no, that's, that's no, 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 no. That's, that's, that's I'm not. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But that was the first stuff so, as well as published. I mean, okay. I, uh, again, I wanted the format where I could do everything. So um, those that look like um, they were car shops at the time. That was uh, a, a possible way of distributing. So I made mail books, which were eight page booklets that I stapled and then put a little like. Uh, you didn't stickers. want to just run down to Kinko's or anything, huh? But there was, it was a Kinko didn't exist, but um, yeah. they were like print shops, but if I could do it myself, like there's a moment where a friend of ours was running a bookstore on um, Spring Street called uh, Spring Street Books, Jim Dugas, and I called him up, and he's the one who had suggested I do a map of Seoul, and I called him up and I said, like, Jim, is there something that you'd like to have for your store? Uh, do you want to have a business card? Maybe a bookmark. Uh, Okay, okay, a bookmark, great. Um, and then I had those instant plates where um, I also had a camera that where I could do things, but I had art draw the doodle on the uh, bookmark. And then I remember calling Jim, like, Jim, I got your bookmark, I got your bookmark. And Jim is like, it's 2 30 in the morning. <laughs> it can wait till tomorrow. <laughs> But it was so exciting, you know, to, again, in the day of in Thule, uh everybody having a color printer in their house, I don't know that you can, the, the marriage of industrially produced multiple copies of something that you can actually yourself bind and staple and at this time, we were beginning to meet artists from different countries and whatever uh, were involved in fairly sophisticated graphic design, illustration, and comics, where among the first things that she printed is these little eight-page booklets. Uh, so it was, in a way, the, the genuine seeds of Raw magazine. Well, I actually see something down at the bottom right there. It actually says Raw on it. It looks like an early version well, of the logo. Yeah, that was actually a, a party at the Dems of Chile. So in raw, the impulse came to me to try to put something that would be um, putting all of this disparate stuff together. The old stuff like Spears, there's something by Canon Dash, there's a book by Mark Byers, there's one by Art, there's one by Todd Burns, there's one by uh, Ben Gouri, French artist, um, Robert Sam Gallery. I wanted to have everything in one place, and Art was like, no magazine. I don't want. Okay. So that's so basically that's that's you're starting to think. What if we just did all that in one magazine? Yes, yes, and there was something. Oh, we're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting there. there was something to um, the range of things. You know, partly was was the fact that it was a and um, between the stuff when he came to uh, France and then we went together to Amsterdam and to Spain and to Italy. There were things that were together even though the styles were completely different. And now, would you see their art printed somewhere or would other people like introduce you to like the art printed? Like, things were a little bit ahead of where America was at that point and there were comic shops that had the equivalent of zines or small press things. And as we're rummaging around it, it was like, I didn't know that I was looking for uh, 
um, a new gang of artists that we published at once in one place at the time. But there were common denominators in the sense that nobody was like anybody else. That was the common denominator. So we we find artists who were really who were unique, and they were working with words and pictures. They were working in panels. They weren't like each other. So. In Raw, we were just looking for people who were making something new in comics. And at that moment, at the first issue of Raw, we were very uh, inhibited about using any of the underground comics friends I had because we didn't want it to seem like an underground comic. You know, the way you just described it to me um, seemed a little bit like Mad Magazine, where you had every everything was a different artist with a completely different style. Well, yeah, yeah, like BC cartoons were encouraged to be themselves as illustrators, not as writers. Like so, the best of Med was done by R.B. Kurtzman. He wrote everything and micromanaged every panel. Uh, I wasn't quite after that, but we did want to put collisions of very different styles and very different mentalities together. And the common denominator there was almost everybody except one artist was incredibly depressed. So uh, the, first, the, the, first was, well, issue so the first issue was called The Graphics Magazine of Postponed Suicides. <laughs> um, <laughs> a quote by E.M. Sciorian who said, every book is a postponed suicide. <laughs> but the, what, what, what we were looking for was not a house style. Like, um, at some point, um, you know, we realized that we were doing the opposite of what the magazine normally does. So the magazine, the, chooses one logo, look at the New Yorker, and repeats it for like uh, every single week for nine years. In Vogue, we change the logo every single issue. We change the subtitle every single issue. We change the uh, styles of all the various uh, artists, such as with Jerry Moriarty, such as Charles Burns, um, such as Mark Byer. And what we found when we were talking to all those different artists is that we admired and respected each other's work when they were discovering it. And that's what the common denominator is that everybody had, as artists, a unique voice. What, what became interesting retroactively is seeing that each of the artists that we found, that we were like using more than once, or sometimes even just once, in Raw, couldn't find congenial places to publish, in a sense, even in Europe because they weren't like other things. And yet each of them also at the same time uh, recognized each other and also created inadvertently schools of a kind. Like Jos Swart, who had invented this clean line style uh, that was uh, taking um, Tintin and revving it up. Uh, oh, you have that page by hand. Oh, yeah. So he's, he's doing something called the clean, the clear line. And he had revived this kind of uh, style that was almost as um, off the charts as Crumb uh, reviving the um, Thimble Theater, L.Z. Seeger, uh, Basil Wolverton, dirty, ratty style in a world of Peanuts, UPI, AUS is more cartooning. Um, and so each of these artists seemed to develop like people going, oh yeah, one can do it that way. And then there'd be a whole lineup behind them of people doing that. Gary Cantor is another one. You know, it was an artist that at the time was kind of electrifying in that first punk moment. And uh, I don't know if you followed any of this, but there sure were about 50 artists all looking like different versions of Gary Panther because he changed his approach every three months and developed a different school of imitators. Yeah, the, this, this magazine, there's only, how many issues were there? Well, when we started, we were saying that we're going to publish either twice a year or once every two years. This was, again, the advantage of uh, my language skills over hers in English. Because uh, said, so we should do a magazine. I said, no, I did arcade. I don't want to ever do that again. You get everybody mad at you, because if you don't give them enough pages, or you're exploiting them. Um, so uh, I said, well, if I'm going to do a magazine, and I'll, I'll then have to combine Mouse, which I had started with Raw, and I don't know when I can make a deadline. So let's do it as a biannual. And that was good because if you, it's really confusing. A biannual either comes out twice a year or once every two years. And I think, this was a deadline I could meet. <laughs> so we did eight large size issues of Raw, and I think we then changed formats so we could have longer stories to a small Paris Review size type magazine. And that, that Atlanta, yeah. and that was like uh, three issues of that. But the first year, 1980, um, 
Mass to put out two issues, one in July, one in December. After that, it was one issue of Roe and one issue of One Child. Things like Jimbo or um, the book. Like that Harris. artist, Mariscal, was the only person who wasn't depressed. <laughs> he hadn't heard the bad news. When I saw him in Angoulême a few years ago, he was totally bummed out. But like back in 1980s, he was doing great, and very exuberant. And uh, it was just someplace inspired by somewhere between uh, Saul Steinberg and Robert Crumb, uh, and maybe Uwe Iwerks, he came up with this crazy way of making things, and became a very important designer with Memphis. This is that guy, Pascal Dury. Uh, that was an issue of, and he um, unfortunately died young. He's the only one who really seemed to collect art books. Like he had a totally pristine one room apartment that had a, a, a thousand hardcover, beautifully printed books of very contemporary art that nobody amongst the rest of us would look at or could understand. Uh, but he was doing this, this particular thing, was originally done for some very tiny French zine and had all these penises in it. And we were trying to get newsstand, and we had newsstand distribution, so I didn't know whether we should just try to get away with it and put it out, but then I realized, no, no, it's better to take advantage of all the liabilities. So we blanked out all the penises, uh, and then in the front of the magazine, we said, like, if you send us a sofa down, uh, dress down the envelope and proof of age, we'll send you the penises. <laughs> <laughs> so we printed up stickers with all the penises, and, like, right across the store. That was fun. <laughs> I remember getting this one thing, like this woman said, it's very beautiful, uh, her, her driver's license, and she's stunning and says, I must have the penises. <laughs> <laughs> and then, oh, that's important. Yeah, like if you go from the, the last page of the Pascal Dory thing, where there's no interest in trying to cover up the penises, because you couldn't even find anything in that picture. So I've been looking for the penises, I've been yeah. looking for the penises in here for... <laughs> <laughs> so we let that be as it is, that's the explosion at the end of that strip. Oh god, I found the penises, oh, there's like, oh my god, there's like <laughs> screws and knives and oh... But then the page, when you flip over, the page okay. after, so, and that so, makes an important So this point. is a double page spread, you can see the spine of the book right. in the middle there. And, and then, then when you that's flip, the end of that story, and you'll flip the page, and you get a Yul Swart thing, about as clean a thing as we could find in this beautiful, restful, blank white area. Two artists <coughs> from opposite ends of the uh, aesthetic spectrum, in a way. And I think that was the, if you want to talk about editing raw, that was editing raw. That was like trying to like let people be fully themselves and create collisions by the, or, or continuations. The way things were placed were as important as the, what the things were. There was an argument that you wanted to make with the magazine, which is not that comics couldn't exist, or that we had, like a lot of the other science magazines, like Meta Journal was science fiction, where like specifically advocating like either humor or science fiction or genre, but we wanted to say like comics can be anything, you know, it's very open-ended, and it can be all those different styles, and it was best made by putting together long stories, short stories, uh, graphics. I mean, we called Raw magazine of graphics because there were single images. We had illustrated text pieces. Um, we did, and we were bringing uh, after the first issue, we began bringing like the uh, a, a part of the underground comics along into this new large format magazine. At the same time, we were bringing in. European artists who were doing something novel within their own cultures, as well as at some point my really talented students from the School of Visual Arts and bringing their work into the magazine with everything else, as well as bringing painters who had a cartoony brain somehow into the magazine. I, I should say I, I can tell you I can tell you the effect it had on me. Um, I went into a store in 1986. This is jumping ahead a little bit in our story. Um, better, otherwise I'll be here till four. I know, uh, and I found this magazine, and I was it, it had the effect in every way of what you're saying. I it exploded my sensibilities about comics. I was not that interested in comic books. I hadn't been since I was twelve, maybe, but I was really into comic strips. Uh, and this at that time, Doonesbury was like my favorite comic strip. I loved Pogo and Peanuts, and was a Dick Tracy fan. And I went into this comic store, didn't even know they existed, and I found this raw. 
And I was just, I'm, I'm just holding it. I, got, I can't even believe the colors and the size. And I had no idea it was, you know, basically small print runs that it was so self-published. And I didn't really even know, you know, some of these are European. I just, unless their name was very clearly, you know, European or something. And it, 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 it does exactly everything you said. Let's get to the mouse in the room, shall we? Now this is uh, starting with issue two of Raw. Every, and we're gonna come back a little bit to the aesthetics of Raw in a moment. Um, in it, starting with issue two of Raw, each issue contained a, a serialized chapter of Art's work, Mouse, this comic story, Mouse. And what's interesting is that, again, it's, it, you turn the